get into our word today. I won't hold you long. I won't hold you. But I do think that what we're talking about today um, is really uh, uh, important because I believe it has the potential to change our perspective on a lot of things. All right. So y'all ready? Y'all ready for some paradigm shifts? Some get okay. All right. So we're going to open with um, 1 Timothy 6, uh, starting at um, verse 2. Now, I don't want you just looking at me. I want you to get out a pen, a paper, get out uh, your phone, notes, because after you leave here, you might not remember everything that I done said. So why don't you, um, you know, take some notes. You all remember sermon notes? That used to be a, a whole thing. Mm-hmm. So don't take my word for it. Write it down. So we're going to start at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, starting at verse 2b. And I'm reading from the NLT version. Um, We're going to do a lot of Bible today. Y'all all right? The Bible could talk better than I ever could. So y'all y'all good? Y'all going to get your, you know, this going to help you because some of y'all didn't read your Bible this week. So I'm just trying to help you to get it out. Oh, was that too low? Too bad. Okay, okay. Come on. Come on. Bring it back. All right. Here we go. It says, teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over meanings of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Don't that sound like you? Um, something that we just scrolled if you was on Instagram? Did you see any of these things on Instagram this week? It feels like this is like, Paul, how did you know that what we are already going through? Verse 6, yet... True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Somebody say great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be what? Content. But people who long to be rich say long People who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. My God. Cue the OJs. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. May God bless God's holy word. Let's just sit in that for a minute. That just, that's a whole mouthful, right? So to, based on this passage of scripture, scripture from our uh, lectionary, I want to talk today about counter-narratives. Counter-narratives. Can you say that with me? Counter-narratives. If you don't know what a counter-narrative is, it's an argument that disputes a commonly held belief or truth. These beliefs often relate to cultures, people, and even institutions. This is what a lot of our justice work is about here, right? In a way, and this is a lot of the things that Pastor Mike is doing. We specialize in counter-narratives, which can also be called counter-storytelling. Because how many know it matters who's telling your story? Which um, is used to give people a voice who otherwise wouldn't have one. a counter a narrative, if a narrative outlines a widely expre- accepted beliefs of truth, a counter narrative can be used to share a different point of view that may have not otherwise been considered. We're talking about con- counter narratives. Back in 1968, James Brown wrote a song that says, I'm black and I'm proud, say it loud. This was a counter-narrative. 
because up to then, we was, it wasn't seen to be uh, beautiful to be black. It wasn't something that you were proud of. We were called colored or Negroes, and this was the dawn where we were like, we're going to take our own story and say how we want to be seen, and we're going to say it loud, and we're going to say it proud because we've never been able to express it in this way. It was a counter-narrative. And how many know that the Bible is filled with counter-narratives? It's a, it's a crazy story. It, it, it goes past what we're used to. You know, things like if you want, you, if you want to be great, you got to be, you got to go down, down the way up. Uh, if someone slaps you, you need to turn the cheek. The first shall be. And if you want to find your life, you must lose it. Counter narratives, things that go against our intuition. And as believers in Christ, do I have any believers? Raise your hand if you are a believer. As believers, we, our lives are supposed to be counter narratives in this world. Found counter narratives. Uh, Romans 12, 2, we all know this, but it's on the screen. Romans 12, 2, it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and, per and pleasing and perfect. It's a counter narrative. Whatever the world is dishing out, there's supposed to be this other voice, and we're supposed to be living in a different way. We are in this world and not of this world. Y'all still believe that? That we are just temporary residents passing through. Sometimes I think we forget that this world is not our home. Y'all remember that? We just passing through. We just pilgrims on a journey. This is not our, our home and our citizenship is in heaven. So sometimes we holding on to everything down here. This ain't it. This ain't all. This not all what it is. We are supposed to see the Bible and see things from heaven's perspective. Amen. Let's start looking at things from heaven's perspective. So let's get back to this passage. This passage today is hard. It's a hard passage. It's a hard passage if you have been formed with the Western lens of thinking. If you've been formed with a lens of hustle mentality, with scarcity and lack. And if you're from the hood, this might be your narrative. <laughs> Everybody throwing up the hood. Western culture tells us to get rich or die trying. My God. Hustle and grind. Get it by any means necessary. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We, we, we always on the go, always, on, always reaching, always striving, always achieving. If you sat down for a minute, they're like, what's wrong with you? You got what? Well, you should be working. Well, we, we, we out here 24-7, right? This is, the, this is the mentality that we are fed. And every kid from the hood longs to get out. At least that's what they tell us. That's what they try to um tell us in every movie and every song and every story that we trying to get out and that we want nice things, right? You ever watch those um, lifestyles that are rich or famous or the house hunters? Like, we like nice stuff. You ever go in a blood? Most black people, when we walk in places, we like, ooh, this nice. Ooh, this fancy. Ooh, girl, look at this. We like the nice, fancy, new, shiny. But this passage causes us to peel back a layer and investigate the why behind the hustle. What is your why? What is your why? So for context sake, for context sake, go back and we're going back to that Timothy verse. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. This is what this book was about, to establish a counter narrative against the false teachers that were there. If you've been coming to Tuesday Bible studies, we've been learning about what was the most popular belief system. I don't know if I see anybody in here from Bible study. Anybody remember what it is? Oh, no. <laughs> Put it on the spot. Starts with a G. Gnosticism. Yes, good job, Tuesday Bible learning. If you come to Bible study, you but no, no, just kidding. Gnosticism was the fastest growing um, false narrative that was almost overtook the church in the first century. It, we were in, it was in danger until a group of people that formed councils and formed all, it's a whole long story. But anyway, Paul left Timothy there to create this counter narrative 
uh, of some people who were using a show of godliness as a means of financial gain, meaning that their motivation for ministry was money. Anybody, y'all, y'all have seen this before? Miracle spring water? And the prayer cloths, all that kind. All right. We see, <laughs> we've seen this. And the Bible calls this having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know, some people can put on a show. It's the razzle-dazzle. Tell you exactly what it to, you wanted to hear. You need a check. I, I, ooh, a check is coming. You need some, like, anything that gets the people riled up to give, like, you need a prophecy, you need a word, come on, cash me out, and I got you. It's a means of financial gains. This is what Timothy was there counteracting. And what is the results of this? People who live in this way, people who always strive for money, people who are doing, trying to put on a front or a face like they're doing something good, but all they really want is money. We see this in verse 9 and 10. 1 Timothy 2, y'all should be looking and reading. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. It says, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction for the love of money. Does it say that money is the root of all evil? It clearly says it's the love of money. It's the root of all kinds of evil. Some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. We see this in the lives of so many people who seem to have everything. Have you ever noticed that? That's the biggest mystery. You got everything. You made it out the hood. You did it. You got five cars or a big mansion. What you sad about? Why are you still depressed? Why are you taking drugs? You made it. You're famous. You're rich. You did it. You're on top of the world. Now what? Why are you, why are you not happy? Why are you? I don't understand. What seems like they're still miserable. What is the missing element when we chase money, when we chase the dollar, when we chase um, all these things, trying to feel something inside of us, trying to make money be the end all and the be all, trying to make money fill a gap, trying to make money make up for some insecurities, trying to make money and use money as a revenge. Now, I'm going to show them now. Watch when I got money. Now, they go, what they going to say? We use money in so many different ways and so many different narratives, but Paul had a counter narrative for this type of mentality. Are y'all ready? Paul gave us the formula. It is right there in the scripture. It is nothing new. It says, godliness plus contentment equals great gain. It's like an algebra formula. Anybody like algebra? I don't. But here we go. A plus B equals Y and Y. Okay. What are we using? Where did I need? When did I need this in my life? Maybe now. Now I did because it is a formula. Okay, got it. A formula. Sorry, math teachers. I love you. The formula is godliness plus contentment equals what? Great gain or true wealth. Come on, can we talk today about what true wealth is? True wealth. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain or true wealth. If you want true success, see, because success is relative. Success is equal to, like, what is your definition of success? Is it with your bank account? Is it when you made it, when you got your boo, when you got your kids? Like, what is success? What does success mean to you? You need to narrow down these things because um, if you want true success, combine godliness with contentment. Paul called both of these, get it, it's a mystery and a secret. It's a mystery and a secret. So let's break this down. Break this down. First of all, godliness. When you first hear the word godliness, it says, Paul says that it's a mystery. Sorry, an ant like my, um, want to be a part of the sermon. All right. It's a mystery. According to 1 Timothy 3.16, check this out. It says, um, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. It's a mystery. Now check out, check out what the mystery is. He, Jesus, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed by the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. That sounds like the gospel to me. 
it's a mystery. It's a mystery. So what is godliness? When we hear godliness traditionally, we think of a, a, a reverence for God or someone who's walking around being real holy. They got the long skirt. They ain't wearing no makeup. We just go, they're going to be mean to everybody. They're going to tell you where you can and cannot go. I mean, because we godly. You can't do that. They generally telling everybody who's going to hell and who's going to heaven. Godliness. Like, that's usually what we talk about. Like, man, you, you got to be on, on the up and up, the straight and narrow. You got to be on it. You got to wear your white usher uniform. You got to have it. Right? Godliness. But I want to I wanna give you another facet of godliness. Godliness is a lifestyle that consistently pursues and reflects the character of God. Amen. Consistently pursues and reflects the character of God. Godliness means you are literally a walking, what would Jesus do? You, you not just a t-shirt or a bracelet. It's you. You're the advertising. What would Jesus do? That's how your life is. What would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus react? How would Jesus respond? That's you. That's godliness, Right? Godliness depends on knowing God's revealed truth. This is so good. Y'all got to walk with me. It's knowing God's revealed truth because Paul speaks of the knowledge of truth that leads to godliness in Titus. There is a godly sorrow that leads to salvation in 2 um, Corinthians. Peter declares that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Godliness imparts knowledge of himself by revealing the Son. This is so important for you to know what godliness is for your life. So when you're hearing the word godliness, you're not thinking, I got to act or I got to do or I got to be. The Greek word translates godliness in our English translation as means of a proper response to the things of God, which produces obedience and righteous living. Come on, sit in that for a minute. It's a proper response to God's goodness. So if it's a mystery, that means you are actually personalizing the gospel. This is so, come on, walk with me. You have to personalize the gospel. You can't just hear it. You can't just understand it. You have to come to a point where God reveals the truth to you for yourself. You have to actually know that it's a fact that God took on human flesh to live among the people he created. It's a fact that he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice in our place. You got to say it was for me. And then God raised him from the dead by, and conquered death for all who trust in him. This is the mystery of godly, godliness. Godliness is God's son now being reflected in us. Do y'all know what the goal of Christianity is? We always think it's, oh, I got to make it to heaven. That's like a, a component of it. But we are always being transformed into the image of his son. That is the goal. We are continually being transformed into Jesus' image. We are living epistles. When people see us, they should be able to see God flowing and operating and living through it. Every day, our goal is to become more like Jesus, more like Jesus, more like Jesus. You know, this is the true essence of the gospel. And we flip it into God, what can I get out of it? Give me, give me. Wait, what about me? Can I, here's my list, here's my thing, here's my... When you get into the true essence of what the gospel is, it's about us reflecting Jesus. Y'all following me? All right, so that was godliness. Now, godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Let's talk about contentment. Contentment is something that does not compute for most of us. We say it and your mind just starts, smoke comes out your ear. It does not compute. Because contentment is so countercultural. The purpose of marketing, do I have any marketing majors in here? No? Okay, good. Because I'm about to talk about y'all. The purpose of marketing is to make you discontent with what you have. Do you know that? Y'all know that, right? I wish I had a few marketing majors to, to back me up. It's to make you discontent. You wasn't even thinking about some new dishwashing liquid until you saw it. You, you got a whole closet full of shoes already. 
And now the whole, I'm sorry, I'm stepping on some toes. But <laughs> the looks I just got. <laughs> we got, you know, a lot of stuff, things you want to eat. You ever saw a commercial? You weren't thinking about no chicken until it came on. Right? This, the purpose of it is to make you discontent, to make you always say like, wow, I don't have that. Well, I have this, but I need a new wardrobe. I need, the, I need a spring collection. I need, the, I need the next one. iPhones, this was classic. You just got it. You just got the, the little number, whatever number they own. Is it, a, is it 13 already? I just got rid of my seven, because I was like, no. I know. I'm not going to play these games with y'all. But as soon as you get the newest and the greatest, here they come. Here they come. Holla at me when y'all get the holograms. That's when I'll, I'll be, but give me that one. But advertisers spend billions of dollars each year to make sure that you never feel content. You never have the, the right car. You never have the right clothes. You never have the right product for your hair. You never have. You never have. You always got to try more. Peep it. When you go home today, watch. When you're watching commercials, peep it. Peep game. You know, they, they always want you to want more, to want more, to buy more. And they're dependent on, especially our black people, they are dependent on our black dollars that we say we don't got to keep them in business. That's a whole nother. I'm, I'm going to get back to my sermon. So because of this, this discontentment, it's easy to feel unhappy and discontent with your life. The world bombards us with the idea that we need more, that we need more money, we need more success, we need more stuff, more stuff. How many people got so much stuff in your house that you need to let the stuff go? We just got stuff on top of stuff. We're now we're trying to do a minimal, minimalist lifestyle because we got so much stuff. We're doing wardrobe capsules because we got so much stuff. <laughs> Right? Do you want to know what contentment is? Contentment is being at ease, an inner sufficiency where you are and being thankful for what you have. It's inside. It's an it's a inner ease. It's a sufficiency that, that being content means that you don't need more to be happy. It's when you realize you have everything you need at this moment. It's a, it's a drastic, drastic shift from what we've been taught in culture. Everything we need in life, we already have. Come on, I want you to think about that. You might be like, no, I don't have a million dollars. No, hold on. Everything you need in life, you already have. But somehow, we fail, we fall into the mindset that we need more to be happy. So we block ourselves from happiness, and we do this and try to get more than what we need. We turn into greed, we turn into hoarding, we turn into always one up in one another. Verse, uh, verse seven and eight says, we naked you came into the world, we didn't bring nothing into the world. You ever wonder where that scripture was? That's where it was. We didn't come in here with nothing, we ain't gonna leave with nothing. This is our temporary re residence. So now look at that in the light of those two things. We didn't bring anything, we can't take anything. So now how do you look at the things that we hold in this life? The key to contentment, y'all all right? The key to contentment is to be, <laughs> she said, just get rid of everything, hold on. Now you need something, you need, now hold on, you do need a few things. Hold on now. Y'all y'all was ready to throw it all on the altar. Bring it all on the altar, we gonna burn it. <laughs> Woo, Sister Donna was going all in for Jesus. Yes, Lord. But the key, the key to contentment is to constantly, is to be constantly improving, but never becoming complacent. Constantly improving, but never becoming complacent. Because it's a thin line between complacency and contentment. It's a thin line, not just between love and hate, but between contentment and complacency. So contentment means to be happy and be grateful.
But being complacent means refusing to work to improve. You're refusing to do the work. You're refusing to do the work for your mental state. You're refusing to do the work from that trauma. You're refusing to do the work, right? There's a difference. Being complacent is similar to being lazy, but often we get upset with our current situation because we refuse the work that we need to improve. That's being complacent. A complacent person never works to reach their full potential because they feel that it's pointless. It's hopeless. I tried. They go through the motion and always blaming external factors for their shortcomings. How many have been that person before we talk about anybody else? It's been me. I'm going to say, how many people know somebody like that? Wait, hold on. <laughs> it's been me. It's been me. So contentment doesn't mean complacency. Rather, it's learning to be satisfied, listen, until God gives you more. Being satisfied until God gives you more. How many people are waiting for something for God? You're waiting for answer prayer. You're waiting on God. This means you're going to be satisfied until God gives you more. So complaining is empirical proof of discontentment. People who complain are you're just showing evidence that you are discontent. Because content people know that God is always acting on their behalf. God's always acting on your behalf. He's always in the background. God's always moving. God's always working. God didn't forget about you. God didn't put you on the wait list. God didn't drop you off. God is always working on your behalf. I'm going to close with this. Uh, Paul says contentment is a secret. Y'all know that? It's a secret. Philippians 4. Philippians 4.10. We know this verse because we use this for everything but this verse, what it was used for. We use this for marathons, exercises, getting through a test, hard times, not eating food we're supposed to eat. We, this one, we, this, but this is what this, this verse was, was really for. Verse 10, it says, I, great, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned, what you learned, Paul, to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secrets. Come on, say secret. The secret of being content in when? Any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. This is the verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I said they're traditional, but I could do all things through Christ. This is what this verse was for. This verse was not for you going to the gym. You can use it, but if we're going to stay in context, I can do all things, no matter what happens in my life, whether I'm balling or whether I'm broke. In any con in any how was Paul able to do this? <laughs> it wasn't for the gym. <laughs> I'm just trying to get us on context. We got to be in context, saints. In this passage, Paul says that true contentment is in Christ. True joy and true happiness is being able to be known by Jesus and that your salvation is in Jesus. Now, check it out. I know this sounds like very cliche, but I don't know why you signed up for this Christian life. But whatever you need to know, this Christian life will, will not work completely for you and unless you understand that the end all and the be all is Jesus. Like you got you to gotta make up in your mind if Jesus is enough. Jesus plus nothing. With Jesus with no additives. Jesus with no enhancements. Jesus with no accessories. You got to make up in your mind, is Jesus enough? Jesus plus nothing. This is what Paul is saying. I can go through whatever because I have the revelation of who Jesus is to me. Like, I know him for myself. Like, it's personal. 
Like, no, it's not something that someone told me. This is what I know. So the two are a winning combination. Contentment and godliness equals great gain. Now, I have to take a little time out to say um, there's nothing wrong with having money. Amen? amen. Anybody, can I get an amen? All right, yeah, I got a good, yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with having money. You know, I personally believe in black luxury. Um, I think it should be a thing. I think we should be able to live in a luxurious life. And if you have expensive taste, raise your hand if you have expensive taste. Okay, you like what you like. Okay, it's what you, okay. You do you. You like what you like. But the key is for you to have money, but don't let the money have you. You can have the money, but don't let it have you. Don't let it have your heart. Don't let it have your mind. Uh, Hebrews 3, uh, Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The key part of that verse is that Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. Like be content with what you have. Don't go reaching and striving and, and hustling and bustling because when you're doing all that, when you're striving and hoarding and using money to fulfill this gap in your life, you, you, you can't live out what, what Paul says. This is my last verse. In 17, verse 17 in First in Timothy, he says, hey, I got a word for the rich, those who got a little something. Those who got a little something in the bank. Those who got a little something in, they, in, the, in, in the safe, in, the, in their pocket. Verse 17 says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Anybody got an amen? Money be going here, here today, going tomorrow. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for what? Our enjoyment. Now that's a word for you. God gives us all we need because God wants us to enjoy it. God wants to have us to have an abundant, fruitful life. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience what kind of life? It's the true life. This is the true wealth. When God gives you and you can give back, that you're just a conduit that God can use to give blessings to people. We are to live, I say this a lot, with an open hand before God where God can put into our hand at any time and God can take out what he needs at any time and then it's a free-flowing thing and if we're always like this, God can't put in and God can't take out. So we're going to live with, a, with an open hand before God and you're going to have a kingdom perspective that if I have it, I'm good. If I'm broke, hey, I'm just a temporary situation, I'm still good because I have the prize. Please don't walk away if you don't hear anything else from this message. Because why can we be content? Because we have the prize. Do you know who the real prize is? It's Jesus. Now, that's just not a cliche. But when you really have the essence of all things, we have Jesus. God said to Abraham, don't be afraid. I am your shield and I am your exceedingly great reward. God. God is the bag. God is the goal. God is the pride. Like, this is who we have. Come what may. It can come, it can go, it's whatever. I have Jesus. What well, Vicky Wanda said, as long as I got King Jesus. Come on here. Lamentation says, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. God is the portion. So this changes our perspective, and I hope this has given us a different sense and a different a way to uh, a paradigm of how we're viewing money, that we don't have to hustle and bustle and strive for it, that we're going to trust God for what we need, and when we, we're going to learn to live to be content, and we're going to learn to live godly lives, because when you mix the two, you really find true wealth. You find what's really the true meaning of life, and that's helping others, being a community, not hoarding, but giving away. Amen? Amen. 
So for our reflections today, I just have a few of them. You can uh, talk one day, and when I don't talk so long, we could uh, actually talk among each other, but this ain't the day. Um, but for the reflections, you could take a picture of them, or you could um, take it with you for later. Number one, I want you to think about how were you formed to think about money and who taught you? Think about that. Who formed you? How did you, how did you come into how you feel about money, how you hold money, how you use money, and who taught you these things? It's very good to investigate this into your life. Two, how can you increase contentment without falling into complacency, right? How do we increase contentment in our lives? If you find yourself critical and complaining, you might need to dial up your contentment, amen? Uh, three, interrogate the places in your life where you have become complacent. Where is that place where you like, it ain't no hope, I just, you know what, and it, it's no use. I, I'm just going to just chill right here. This is as good as it gets. I don't want to know. Maybe it's a hurt, it's a trauma, it's a disappointment. But that is the place where God wants to continue to let the river flow. Where we're never to be stagnant. Amen? And four, how can, we, how can contentment and godliness create great gain in your life? In your life. Amen? Let's just all stand as we close out. We're just thanking God that God's going to shift the way we are thinking, shift our perspectives in our lives. So let's just uh, have a time of prayer. God, we love you today. We thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is like medicine and it's um, sharper than any two-edged sword. God, we pray that you would begin to trim the fat from our lives. God, we want to find true life and true wealth God is not what the culture is telling us that it is but God I pray that you would just give us a heart to seek after you God give us godliness and contentment so that we can find the true treasures of life the true wealth is found in you Jesus you're the way, you're the truth, and you're the light. All things were made by you, for you, through you, from you. You're the goal, you're the prize. So begin to shift our minds. Let us have counter narratives against the voices of our day, the voices of our culture, who will want us to learn, yearn, and long for more and have more greed and fall into many temptations and fall into many sorrows but God I pray that in this building and online that you will begin to raise up a new group of people who will say God I recognize money for what it is but it won't have my heart only you will have my heart I won't put any idols before you God I just want you so if you're here and this message is speaking to you I want to invite you into a time of prayer. The first prayer is for people who have been sitting in discontentment. And you just want to confess that before God. And you want to, you want to ask God to change your mind about how you view money, how you view, how you're holding things. So for that group of people, will you just lift your hands and say, Lord, I repent. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the ways that I have seen it wrong, the way I have complained, the way I have uh, not approached it with a, with, a, with a grateful heart. God, I'm sorry for putting uh, idols before you. God, I'm sorry for setting money and letting it be the end all and the be all in my life. God, change my mind. Change my heart. Let me be more like you in this area. The second the second round of prayer for those who want to lean into more contentment and more gratitude. If that's you, just raise your hand and say, God, I want to be more like you. God, let me reflect who you are in my life. Let me reflect your character. Let me reflect your image, God. Let me lean into godliness. I'm tired of doing things my way. I'm tired of showing up the way I want to show up, God. Use me. Use my life. 
to be a direct image of who you are. God, I thank you. And then the last group of people who want more contentment, God, will you raise your hand and say, God, I I just want to lean into gratitude. I've been giving you my list of complaints. I've been giving you a a list of the things that are all wrong. And I've been giving you all the, my needs and my wants. But God, I just want to take a moment just to lean into contentment. God, I just want to thank you. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. I just want to thank you for what I have. I got, I want to thank you for life. I want to thank you for health and strength. The the, the old folks used to say a reasonable portion of my health and and strength. God, I just want to thank you for family. I want to thank you for the breath that's in my body. I want to thank you for a shelter. I want to thank you for food and clothing, God. Just the basics. Anything else is a bonus. I want to thank you for the basics. That you woke me up in a right mind. You gave me a mind to serve you. God, I thank you for my senses and activities of my limbs, God. God, thank you for the basics. Anything you give me above is above and beyond. So, God, increase my gratitude. Open my eyes that I might see who you are and what you've been to me. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last one is if anyone here and you don't know who Jesus is, you don't know that Jesus is the prize. You, this is your first time really hearing about Jesus in this perspective. If you would like to invite Jesus into your life today, would you just please repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I invite you into my life. God, I want to walk the way you walk. I want to talk like you talk. So God, teach me. God, how to follow you all the days of my life. I want to be changed by you. God, I I accept you and I believe in you. And I thank you for the change that's taking place in my heart, even right now. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you so much. Come on, let's clap our hands for Jesus. Let's clap our hands for contentment. Let's clap our hands for godliness. How many are expecting great gain? in your life how many are looking for true riches